Hello everyone, welcome to our Saturday broadcast. We're here as usual to answer questions. Looking for questions about your practice. Been here before, you know the rules. Questions should be important to you, not just curiosity questions, not just intellectual questions. Not because you're doubting about this one obscure thing or one philosophical idea. If you, if you bring up those sorts of questions, I'm just going to, my answer is going to be to tell you to note the doubting. We're looking for practical questions, questions of importance to your practice. If we have time, we'll move on to more theoretical questions about Buddhism, but don't count on it. If you don't have any questions that are important to you, that's great. Good news. That means you're confident and that you can continue practicing. We'll spend the first, well, till the quarter after the hour, we'll spend in silent meditation, walking or sitting or both. And it's a chance for you to come up with any questions, post them in the chat. Or, of course, once you've asked the question, to just clear your mind and cultivate the clarity of mindfulness. I'll be back at 15 minutes after the hour to begin answering questions.
All right, we're back. So if you have questions, continue to ask them in the chat. From here on, we'll close the chat to anything that's not a question. If you don't have questions, again, we can just spend the time in mindful meditation. Thank you, Bhante. We do have questions. If I suppress my personal problems and communicate with others through smiles, could this behavior be called into question regarding honesty? Um, a smile is, is pretty ambiguous. If your intention is to mislead people, that's one thing. But a smile, the intention is often just to express friendliness. So if someone asks you how you're really feeling, and instead of telling them, you smile in order to pretend that you're happy, but they're really interested in what they're really asking about is how you're really feeling, then that could be misleading. Um, so th there's a difference between honesty and and truth. Um, I mean, what I mean is, it's one thing to say you're dishonest or manipulative. It's another thing to actually say you're lying. You're not lying by smiling, and lying is really where you cross a line. It's not easy to always be um, free from manipulation or or deception, and sometimes. Without outright lying, it, it, there are cases where it's okay to be deceptive. Deceptive, just don't lie. Don't don't cross that line where you've made a definitive statement. Um, other, I, I mean, honestly, this sounds like maybe you're worried about this sort of thing, and that's the more important issue. You should not worry, worried. But um, as far as you also shouldn't suppress your personal problems. But I guess what you mean is suppressing them in in a, in the company of others. Um, and best is to be mindful of them as, as best you can. I'm adopted from Sri Lanka to Denmark, and I don't know my biological parents. According to Theravada Buddhism, do I then have an obligation to find and locate them, even though that's a painful and difficult process? Or are my obligations only towards my adoptive parents? I'm careful not to make a narrative out of this, and also to be mindful of the thoughts, feelings, and reactions that arise. So any obligations you have towards your parents are conventional. They're, they're worldly. They're not absolute. There are no laws surrounding these things, not in, in Buddhism. The Buddha makes these remarks about obligations with the, under the assumption of, of a normal, ordinary, um, uh, a situation, and which of course doesn't fit, doesn't fit completely. Hardly anyone, and you have to figure out how far you are from that norm, meaning how far you are from where you can have a normal relationship with your parents. And if you, to the extent that you can, well, to that extent, you should certainly express gratitude and appreciation and humility and kindness towards your parents. They've done in a normal situation. They've done a lot for you, but in the many kinds of abnormal situations, that is going to change. And so, like any worldly conventional thing, you have to adapt. There's no rule. There's no law that you should try to follow. The only law that you should try to follow really is to be reasonable. So, what is reasonable? Is it reasonable to go and find your bi biological parents? Well. You could think that they uh, carry your mother ca carried you in her womb for nine months. That's a lot of work, and it was probably hard for them to give you up. So, if you could somehow connect with them and let them know that you're doing all right to make them feel better, that'd be a great kindness and a great way to thank them for taking care of you in the womb. Assuming that they did, of course, yes. Assuming that they took care of you while you were in the womb. But yeah, don't take things too literally or too seriously. You have to be reasonable at all times. That's how you deal with worldly affairs. 
mindfulness helps you be reasonable. So just try and be mindful of all your feelings and thoughts, and don't give these things any any uh, existence greater than they they actually have. They're just ideas. They're not real. There's no entity. Parents is just an idea. It's just a concept. It's a useful and important one, but still just a concept. During my sitting meditation, I am usually not able to be aware of the touching points. Sometimes I do feel a subtle sensation, but again I am not sure whether it's real or imagination. Do you have any advice? Well, that's kind of the point of the exercise, or that's one of the benefits of doing an exercise based on reality, is it's going to challenge you not going to be as you expect it's going to throw you off guard it's going to frustrate you it's going to trigger your reactions like frustration because you appro we approach it as a uh, computational task of sorts or i don't know how to say it but as a, 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 um, a like we're a computer like we should just be able to do a b and c and get d you know step by step by step, and it should work as though we're a computer, because that's what we think of ourselves as something that is under our control, this body, this mind. We can use it as we like. We have used it as we liked our whole lives. That's the truth. That's reality. When you look a little bit deeper and do try to uh, be a little more objective, you realize these things that you're not really in control. Why can't I just send my mind to this spot? The sensation is unpredictable. And whether it's there or not, you just send the mind to the spot and say touching. And it's going to sort of challenge you to be flexible because it's not going to be the same each time. It's not going to be the way you expect it. It's not meant to be perfect. This isn't a task that you get a, a, a grade based on how accurately you did it. The only benefit you get out of it is by, from letting go. And you'll see it gets easier as you let go of the many things that you cling to, and that's the whole point of it. My greatest hindrance in meditation is the mental furniture left over from my previous faith. Prayer and pursuing union with God emotionally feels right, as opposed to being mindful. How to overcome? just a feeling um, these are things you should note you shouldn't just reject them outright but you should note them you'll find that if you're a little more mindful of them so there's not an opposition you don't have to do one or the other when you feel uh, like praying uh, even if you do pray well then be mindful of that or be mindful of while, while you do those things and you'll quickly start to see how I would I don't I hesitate to say it but childish it is it's pretty simplistic to have these uh, you know they 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 they're kind of the things that kids like the the um relying on a god relying on a a, a, a powerful father figure or mother figure that sort of thing parental figure relying on someone else is very comforting but it's kind of child. I mean, by childish, I don't mean immature. I just, well, kind of, but just mean how ch children act. Mindfulness is kind of a wake up, and and it's not a rude awakening. It should be a gentle and gradual and uh, uplifting awakening to realize that you're so much more, and there's so much more, and reality is so much more than just a relying on some illusory comfort blanket but you don't have to overcome you just have to face and observe face the aversion towards being mindfulness how it feels wrong perhaps and be mindful of these things because you, know, you can't really criticize mindfulness it's really pretty simple and innocuous it's the most simple innocuous innocent pure thing you can do there's there's no way to criticize it not not valid, not with any validity. So just apply it to everything, both the things you like and the things you don't like and the things you're not sure about. 
all of those things you should be noting. Do actions trigger certain mind states? I had been trying to build better habits and saw good effects, then habitually slash foolishly added just a few habits back and old mind states appeared. Yes, actions can trigger certain mind states for sure. But it, it, it's because you're triggerable. It's not, they don't have the, the power in and of themselves, but they are triggers for what we call anusaya. You have the tendency or the proclivity or the, the underlying potentiality based on ignorance, based on delusion. So, I mean, what you describe is understandable. It's, it, of course, to be expected. The path isn't going to be just a straight line. It's going to be a challenge. And a big part of the challenge, a big part of the progress, is to change your attitude from trying to get rid of all the bad habits to facing them. So part of the disappointment is that you were trying to escape them and you thought you'd escape them and now they're back and that disappoints you. Instead, you should try to face the habits as they arise. Don't try and fix them. Don't try and change them. Don't try to get rid of them. Just try and understand them. The getting rid of happens as the more understanding you have. The greater your understanding, the weaker their hold is over you. When I'm mindful, I feel like I'm a disciple of the Buddha, of Master Yatadamo. I'm safe, righteous, and worthy. When I'm not mindful, I feel like I'm none of the above. Is it correct? Well, I would say it's correct, probably, that that's how you feel. I assume you're not lying about describing how you feel. You may be embellishing it a bit or, well, I mean, what you're doing is reifying it. You're creating an I feel and, and this, this is a narrative that you're saying that this is how I feel, which is not really accurate because how you feel changes from moment to moment and there's no I feeling it. It's just feelings arise moment to moment. So yes, okay, accurate. When I'm mindful, I feel good. I feel enlightened, right? Um, when I'm not mindful, I don't feel enlightened, basically. And that's great if that's that's the truth. Um, so it's uh, yes, it's correct that that would be the sort of thing you would expect. Mindfulness makes you feel good and clear-minded, and being unfind mindful. Well, you don't even know how you feel when you're not mindful. You're not really very aware. But, I, oh, sorry, to just add to that, um, you shouldn't cling to such feelings. When you feel safe, righteous, worthy, you say, so then you feel unworthy, unsafe, unrighteous. These are all important objects of mindfulness rather than try to uh, prevent them. So by... Um, trying your hardest to make sure they don't arise, you should face them when they arise, when you feel unsafe, when you feel unrighteous, when you feel unworthy. But also when you feel safe, righteous, and worthy, there can be liking of it, and that leads to disappointment when it goes away. Because even the good results of mindfulness on the mundane level are impermanent. They're good, and they're a good sign. But the liking of them is a problem because, well, first of all, when you're liking, you're no longer mindful. But also then when they go away because you stop being mindful, then it's worse. You, you, you give rise to unpleasantness, disliking, discomfort, disappointment. After cultivating the habit of mindfulness, I see random states of meditation slash mindfulness occur on their own without any effort. Does the mind state's experience become a habit of mind and thus more effortless? Well, you can answer that yourself. These uh, 
These are questions you should be able to answer through the practice. And it sounds like you're, sounds like a fairly, I mean, I'm not sure why the, why the question when it, you've described, unless you're lying to yourself, not likely. Um, then, I mean, the answer is pretty, uh, pretty obvious that as you're mindful, that's the sort of thing that happens, becomes a habit. The Buddha said, them, whatever you, in, whatever you uh, engage in or incline towards your mind, whatever you engage in repeatedly, regularly, and with great uh, conviction, your mind inclines towards it. So you're changing the direction of your mind's inclination. Are these claims correct? One, we should not try to control experience, it's not possible. Two, we should try to change our perspective through meditation. Let seeing be seeing. This, in contrast, is possible. It's not even so much about what's possible or not possible. Um, not, not to say that that's not correct, but... Um, yeah, it's more in the we should. Yeah, we should try to change our perspective. We should not try to control experience. It's not it, because whether it's possible or impossible is irrelevant. It's it's what happens when you try. I mean, based on the fact you could say it is impossible, but that's not the point. The point is it's it leads to suffering when you try. The more you try to control, because things are out of our control, it leads to stress and suffering. Do you have any advice for self-sabotage? It's frustrating to fall into the same bad patterns, mental habits, again and again. Yeah, well, it's not frustrating. You get frustrated by that. The truth is that that's an important understanding, understanding that uh, you're not in charge of your habits and they're out of your control. Because that knowledge, you see, we enter into these habits willingly uh, and, and unwittingly, not realizing what you're now seeing is that they become uncontrollable. And so it's important that you pay attention to that and pay more, greater and better attention to that so that it really gets dr drilled into your mind that these things are out of your control. You'll be less inclined to cultivate them in the future. It's not frustrating. You're getting frustrated, and you should note that as well. Note the bad patterns, but not try to change them, not try to stop them. Not try to get rid of them. Just try to understand them. Try to become more familiar with them, because it's lack of familiarity that leads to reaction. You're reactionary towards things that you're not familiar with. If you're completely and thoroughly familiar with thing with reality with it with anything it's not going to take you off catch you off guard it's not going to make you upset or or make you attracted to it either because there's nothing attractive about things either it's just familiarity that's all you need since practicing meditation i'm seeing thoughts arise on their own is it a good habit to cultivate new good thoughts for future arising, or will my actions do this alone? It's, it's a good habit, yes. It can be a very powerful thing to cultivate good thoughts. Um, we do this when we do chanting sometimes, and also just making, a, making determinations, wishes for, think, for, for what, you, what you think you're you're looking to like may I become free from suffering? May all beings be free from suffering? And that sort of thing. Good thoughts for I don't know what you mean by for future arising exactly. Um, but yeah, giving rise to good thoughts is is valuable. Just go with that. When doing walking meditation, during the standing portion, 
How exactly do I focus on the standing? Should I focus on my entire body, the standing posture, or something else? Well, sort of the standing posture. I wouldn't say the entire body because you won't always feel the entire body, but that's not important. Ask yourself how you know that you're standing anyway. And then all you're doing is reaffirming that. When you know that you're standing, you say standing. Just keep it simple. I mean, what's challenging about it is that that's not always even that simple. Sometimes you try to know that you're standing and you don't even know that you're standing, and that's an important part of the practice. The unpredictable nature of it leads to patience and flexibility and letting go. At times when I try to meditate, my mind is overwhelmed with thoughts that are all over the place which makes it difficult to sit still and focus on noting. Should this get better with practice? Yes. Yes, but you don't want to look at it as necessarily, you don't want to look at it as a bad thing. You don't want to have negative feelings about it because that just makes it worse. So make sure you're noting if you're frustrated or overwhelmed, as you say. If you feel overwhelmed, you can just say overwhelmed, overwhelmed, and if there's liking or disliking if you feel distracted then you just know distracted distracted if it's just too much which it sounds like it can be for you at this at this time you can also do lying meditation try lying down and not rising falling that can help for a bit in walking meditation I don't see any more the arising and ceasing of stepping, and it feels like I'm walking meaninglessly. What should I do? You always want to adapt to your new situation. So if, if the way you perceive things has changed, forget about the way it used to be. That's an important, important lesson. Impermanence. You can't depend upon the way you used to feel that was very easy and, and safe and, and stable. Yeah. You have to practice with what you've got now. I don't see any more the arising and ceasing of stepping. I mean, you don't have to go that into that much detail. I don't, don't think of it so uh, analytically. When you're aware of the foot moving, you note the foot moving. Whether you notice the beginning or the end, or the beginning and the end, it's, uh, you, can't, you can't predict what it's going to be like. But if you feel like you're walking meaninglessly, I mean, that's just a feeling you can stop and note that, note the worry or the doubt or that sort of thing. Stop walking and note. I, I mean, most likely it sounds like there's something going on in your mind that you're not noting. You should stop walking and note it and then go back to the foot. You'll find it a lot easier. But it's never going to be the same. You're always going to be caught off guard. It surprises us. We think we know what meditation is going to be like, and this wisdom that we're going to gain is already what we expect it's going to be like. It'll be this wisdom that I, I think I'm going to get that I don't have that I want. But man, reality is not like that. Reality is good. It's wisdom if it catches you off guard. So the catching off guard is essential to the wisdom. When we return to the abdomen after we note a distraction, why do we wait for the rising to start again instead of noting whatever the movement is, such as if it was mid-rising or mid-falling? Uh, to keep it simple, I mean, there's more to it than just the rising and falling. We have more exercises for you, which will help me, help you understand why that is. But, but uh, even just on that level, it's it's just simpler. There's no magic behind noting in the middle of rising or something like that. You're, you're going to have better results if you wait for a, the next experience. Just keep it simple and it'll always be rising fully.
What is the right way of understanding of the three marks of existence other than the present moment seeing? When I think and see things being impermanent and unsatisfying, by default a sense of despair and sadness comes with that understanding. How to see it correctly? Is there supposed to be a separation in the two aspects, i.e., things being impermanent and feeling despair over this fact? Well, the despair doesn't come from seeing things as think and seeing things as being impermanent. The despair comes from attachment, your desire for things to be permanent or stable. That's the real culprit. You can't blame reality. Uh, but you don't have to go around forcing these ideas on your mind. We don't practice seeing clearly. We practice watching. We practice being mindful. The seeing clearly comes by itself. When you see clearly, it's not perhaps, I mean, again, this is going to catch you off guard. It's not going to be the way you think it is. It's not the way you're looking at it right now. When you see impermanent suffering and non-self, it, it's going to remove this um, wishing for things to be permanent, satisfying, and controllable. It's going to be a observation of reality and a familiarity with reality, and it's going to lead to uh, freedom from this uh, this paranoia, this fear of losing. I mean, the stress and suffering that comes from clinging, from from liking things to, that are permanent and satisfying and controllable. It's going to help you give that up and be free from it and be truly happy, uh, independent of your experiences. Because it's not about whether you see things as not worth clinging to. They're, they're not worth clinging to. It's not whether you see them as permanent or impermanent, they're not permanent. And so it doesn't matter how you see them, they're still going to disappoint you. <laughs> they're still going to cause you stress and suffering, even if you like them and forget about them being impermanent. That's why we suffer in life. That's why life can be so cruel and unpleasant. Because we're, we're, we're not in tune with the way things are. We want for them to be other than what they are. I have ADHD and struggle to meditate. Do you have any advice for making this easier? Everyone has, everyone struggles with meditation, and that's not to trivialize your situation. It can be harder for some people, certainly. It can be much harder for some people. But the struggle isn't a sign that something's wrong. The struggle is uh, a part of the change, a part of the attempt to change anyway. I mean, Trying to just be comfortable all the time is, which doesn't lead anywhere, it leads to stagnation. If you're always trying to fix your problems and not have to deal with things like ADHD, well, that's what gets you in this situation in the first place. Why it's such a struggle is because mostly we try to avoid these things. We try to appease them. What can I do to make it easier? And that's why you ask this question. This is the wrong question. Asking how you can make things easier. I mean, Kind of. It's okay because how can I, what, you, what maybe is better and what you're kind of aiming for anyway, I think, is any advice for making it possible, right? Because it can be impossible. It can be such a struggle that it's impossible. So how do you, um, yeah, I guess make it easier. But the attitude of trying to make it easier is going to make it harder, the attitude of wanting it to be easier is part of the problem. So how to make it easier is to face the struggle, is to kind of embrace the struggle. It's not the right word, but it's kind of how we'd say it in English. You want to confront the struggle and, and observe the struggle. Take it as an object of observ observation. Take the difficulty as an object of observation. Forget about trying to make it easier. Try and focus on how difficult it is. Focus on how you feel about how difficult it is. Focus on the things that make you think it's so difficult. Because ultimately they're not difficult, they're just moments. But it's so hard to see that because of how we're um, conditioned, how we've conditioned ourselves to react to things and to want things to be a certain way and to, to make more out of things than they actually are. That's what leads to things like ADHD. You, you get caught up in ideas and get caught up in 
greed, anger, delusion. So just try and focus on it. But be reassured. I mean, it can be quite reassuring, I think, to appreciate how the struggle is part of it. And it's only really, really a struggle as long as you're fighting against it and trying to make it easier and trying to make the bad, the difficulty go away. You really have to just face whatever it is that makes you think it's difficult. And you'll see, oh, it's actually not difficult at all. That was just my my delusion about the situation. It's not to trivialize it again. I mean, diff the difficulty is there, but it's all delusion because the reality is quite simple. Is it possible to meditate while studying for exams? If possible, how can I do this? Not while you're studying for exams. Um, it's a mental activity, right? Studying. So during those moments when you're studying, your your mind is occupied with something else. But practically speaking, it's absolutely possible. And it involves um, task switching. Is that the word? Where you switch back and forth between mindfulness and studying. So first of all, take frequent breaks. If you know anything about studying, you should never study more than like a half an hour at a time. Short study sessions are good for studying, right? So that's a good excuse to take some time to do mindfulness, because guess what? Mindfulness is also good for studying. So every half an hour, take a break. Five minutes sitting meditation, five minutes walking meditation, or more five minutes walking meditation and five minutes sitting meditation, or even more than that. And also, during the time that you're studying, there may be emotions arise, there may be sensations in the body, pain or headache or that sort of thing, and tiredness, worry, stress, all of these things you can note when they arise. Just pause for a moment, note the experience when it's gone, then go back to studying. It can be very fruitful. I was so amazed because I, I stressed so hard about exams in high school and my first year of university was just painful. I did really well, but it was painful. And then when I came back from doing medita practicing meditation the first time and learning how to be mindful, when I went back to university, I was smiling after each exam. It was, I mean, it was so much easier because my mind was clearer, but it was also just like, who cares? Like the, the, all of the burden was relieved. All of the uh, clinging to worldly things is just, you're not so concerned about it anymore. And it was just like, oh, that was a fun experience. Whereas, and then watching other people when I went back again later as a monk for a short time, it was, uh, or part time just watching people hyperventilate and everyone was on drugs, like they were taking uppers just to be able to study. It was just, hmm. yes, mindfulness is very valuable for students. Is it beneficial to intentionally think distressing thoughts during meditation as a means to strengthen the mind? No. Unwholesomeness doesn't strengthen the mind, it weakens the mind, and it becomes habitual if you're intentionally thinking distressing thoughts. I mean, okay, there are no distressing thoughts, so it's not really a problem with thinking certain thoughts, but we're intending to trigger the emotions is not going to help. It's, um, at the very least, the intentional triggering is going to um, reinforce ideas of control. So you're an attitude of control rather than an attitude of letting go. Letting go means you can't. You have to be patient. It's not. You're not in charge of the meditation. You can't narrate what's going to happen, or you can't dictate what's going to happen. If you do, you you lose the thread. You lose the mindfulness. It's um, it's it's a common idea that we should try to make the meditation better. Uh, streamline it, facilitate it, you know, direct it and dictate the fruits of the meditation, like actually actively seek them out. And that's obviously not the way mindfulness works. Mindfulness is about letting go. And the only way you're going to do that is if you are patient with what you actually experience rather than trying to experience certain things, trying to 
evoke something. You, know, you can't really be trying. The only thing you're trying to do is, well, not do that. You're trying to, um, trying to object, objectify, not objectify. You're trying to, we don't have the English words for this. You're trying to make your mind objective. How to deal with the pressure from the body when practicing sense restraint. I can feel the pressure in the mind when in a grocery store with snacks around and the pain in the body from celibacy. Am I just to endure these? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, what is there to endure? They're just physical. My suspicion is that you're maybe uh, ignoring the mental or trying to avoid the mental as a means of what you call sense restraint. Um, but I think you maybe have a, I, my guess is you probably have a problematic idea of what sense restraint means if you're having these intense physical reactions because there's probably some mental there that you're trying to suppress or trying to ignore or avoid and you should instead be being mindful of it. So uh, if you're mindful of the pressure, then you'll see those things. I don't know what you're talking about, enduring. Um, I mean, enduring, yes, of course, but it's not enough. If you're not being mindful, the endurance is just like the endurance of, an, of a buffalo. That doesn't hit as hard in the West because we don't use buffalo the same way they do in the East. Buffalo is like a dumb cow, like a cow. You're just a cow. like an ox. I will attend 10-day Vipassana course, Goenka, to meditate. I already have a spiritual path and I will incorporate my learning. Any advice, especially on how to continue to effectively meditate? I don't understand. Do you, what do you mean? You're, practic you're going to go and practice the way we teach? It doesn't sound like it. I mean, if you're practicing the way they teach, then you should really ask them. I don't have any advice. I mean, be mindful. But, but it's strange because you're asking, how to, you're asking me how to continue to effectively meditate. So do you mean in our tradition? Um, I mean, if you're in our tradition, I, I would advise against going to a course in another tradition lightly advise against it i mean it's certainly going to be a profitable experience but it makes it hard to stick to one tradition one one technique so if it's all you've got then sure that that's still great but i'm not sure whether you're practicing the way they teach or the practice or if you you do practice the way i teach it's not a big deal. I mean, it's still Buddhism, still mindfulness. Um, but no, I don't have any general advice. I mean, you have to be a little more specific. If you've got a problem, I'm I'm here for you. But if you don't have any problem, well, it sounds like that's your path. Go and do the ten day course and learn what you can. They'll have a lot of advice for you, I'm sure. How to understand whether I am progressing on the path or not. I find that whenever I discuss my practice with someone, it gets worse. So generally avoid discussions on these. When I discuss my practice with someone, it gets worse. Like your practice gets worse? This is the challenge of written questions. We need to maybe think about doing some dial-in questions. We have an a opportunity for people to talk and explain their questions. When you discuss your practice with someone, it gets worse. So I assume you mean your practice gets worse, or your doubt about whether, you know, I assume you mean your practice gets worse. Um, I mean, that's 
really likely just a sign that you have unrealistic expectations of 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 how good your practice is. Your practice can't really just get worse because of discussing it with someone. It just means that you're triggered by something, and maybe you become complacent and then get caught off guard. Like uh, when you make a narrative of how things are, when you discuss your practice, you tell them you're telling them a narrative, and if it's if it's too uh concrete like i am this way and this is how my practice is going i mean it's never going to be accurate because practice is unpredictable and so when it changes you've gotten stuck in that narrative and then you're upset you're because you're caught off guard and you're generally upset and um not ready for the the change you're unable to keep up but how to understand whether you're prog progressing on the path or not I mean, I wouldn't put it like that, whether you are or aren't. The mind is malleable. We know that. You can see how you've developed all sorts of bad habits. So there's no question. I mean, there's no reason to doubt that mindfulness would affect your mind. I mean, it has to affect it in some way. So it's not about progressing. The only question would be, I mean, there's not really a question, right? Because it has to change. Everything you do changes your mind. So... If everything you do includes mindfulness, well, including mindfulness is going to change it in some way. The only real question would be, what are the changes? What are the changes that mindfulness is going to bring? And are they good? And are they worth it? Because they will come. It's, it's impossible that you should incline your mind in a certain direction and, and nothing will happen. You may, might not be able to see them very well, but usually what happens is we have a hard time remembering them. So we do notice benefits from time to time, but then doubt is a bad habit that just comes unwelcome and it's not logical, it's not rational, and it just blinds us to any truth. Doubt, doubt can be a real hindrance. Doubt is the worst of the hindrances, really. So at that point, you would just note doubting, doubting, and then you see the benefit again. Oh, look, when I note doubting, the doubting disappears and suddenly I'm peaceful and, and uh, have clarity of mind. And then you forget it again and think, did it really make the doubting disappear? Then you have to note doubting again. Is it possible that we could be rushing the path, like jumping too far ahead, such as being too restrained in the senses? That's well, certainly possible. The Buddha, in fact, the Buddha, the Buddha remarked upon this. Rushing ahead, it leads to, uh, he said, leads you to overshoot. But it, I mean, it leads you to tire yourself out. It doesn't. Yeah, I mean, overshoot is a fine way of a fine analogy as well. Like if you push too hard, you're just going to overshoot the goal. It means you, you don't get any benefit from it. You just end up on the other side. <laughs> you, you, you just end up in some kind of warped sense of. Uh, so illusory idea of enlightenment that is very fragile and easily shattered. So, I mean, you 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 have to take that as an object of mindfulness. If you are rushing, then you note that the desire, the worry, the fear, all of these things that lead you to rush, lead you to chase, lead you to try to control. Like being restrained in the senses, yes. Restraint of the senses is best done using mindfulness. There are many kinds of restraint of the senses, and the best one, the most practical one, is mindfulness. Sati samwara, it's called. Restraint through mindfulness. Just being mindful, not trying to suppress or control or get rid of, just trying to see clearly, because seeing clearly, uh, it inoculate, it inoculate, inoculate. It, it makes you immune. Inoculate. Thank you. English, huh? Is it all right to pray to Devas for assistance? No. No, you shouldn't pray for Devas to assist, them, assist you shouldn't pray to anyone. I mean, would you say the same about a human being? Is it all right to pray to your parents for assistance? That's a good question. Is it all right to pray to your parents for assistance? It's reasonable to ask them for assistance, uh, but 
you have to appreciate that you're asking for something. They don't have an obligation, and certainly devas don't have any obligation. And so it kind of puts you in their debt, you know. The more you ask for assistance, you have to appreciate that you're asking for something, and you better be humble, and you better be appreciative. They better appreciate that they may just say no, or they might just ignore you. Devas probably will just ignore you anyway. Um, your best bet is to try to wish them happiness, and wish for them to uh, wish wish for that wish happiness for them, and wish wholesomeness for them. May they be wholesome. May they protect people worth protecting, rather than being kind of selfish or self self centered. It's not really very practical either. It's not like devas spend all their time answering the prayers of human beings. I wonder how they look at all these theistic people praying to God. It must look kind of be kind of well. No, some of them probably are very. Some of them probably like it. Probably feel proud about it, and may even answer the prayers. But there's a certain capriciousness to it. They're. they're, they're the other thing is, even if you if you do pray and then you get assistance, well, it can it can have its own negative Im impact as well because you become dependent, just like becoming dependent on your parents, right? If you're always asking your parents for assistance, well, we know what do we know about this? It, it prevents you from growing up. It prevents you from becoming self sustaining. So really, like that earlier question about God and, and how comforting it is, how right it feels to be dependent on God, is, I mean, it's just this uh, instinctual um, dependency where we just don't want to grow up. And it's a really hard thing to make that step of letting go where you become independent and you just stop reacting and stop stop uh, being under the power of your your circumstances right just stop being threatened stop stop uh, you 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 free yourself from the danger of the world that that makes makes you seek out protection from danger but for the protection you get is in mindfulness is in independence or you become independent even of your own health and happy and not happiness, but your own health and well-being. So sickness doesn't even phase you. Old age, death doesn't even get to you because you're independent. So you should only look for assistance from those people who can help you become independent. So that's the question. Can the devas help you become independent? I mean, sure, devas can be very helpful even in that. Devas can be very Buddhist. There are many Buddhist devas. Many Buddhists have become devas as a result of their practice, or as a result of the goodness as a byproduct of their practice. So certainly those ones would be helpful, and probably do help humans on a regular basis. But if they're not helping you become independent, I don't know how valuable it is. Ante, we've crossed the hour. There are two more questions in the top tier prepared. Do you have the time to answer Ready. more? Ready. Thank you. I feel like a loser in life. I have no wife, no kids, I'm broke, and I'm overweight. How can I use meditation to address that? Well, you know what the Buddha said, or I don't even know if it's the Buddha because I don't think I could actually find it. Oh, I think it's in the Dhamma, the, uh, the Jataka or something. A wife around the wrist, a child around the neck, wealth around the ankle. Puto these are shackles. So you are you are a true loser. You know why? Because you've lost these shackles. 
you've lost well you never had them <laughs> so you you have uh, you're a loser because you haven't won these shackles you haven't won these burdens these these bindings these chains that tie you down oh a wife what do they say one one person one suffering two people two suffering having a wife oh what a what a horrible thing that that just sounds so horrible kids oh kids are, are even worse than a wife kids are a burden around your neck right the buddha put them first as the highest burden because you there you got to teach them so you've got to that's the worst thing is that you've got to teach them and what's worse about that What's worse about it is they didn't say, hey, I'm going to be your student and I'm going to respect you. Nope. When my students come to me, they got to respect me or they go home. If they're not respectful, we don't tolerate that. They go home. You can't do that with your kids. And they know it. And they are clear on that. You have to teach them, even though they don't want your teachings. That's the worst part. I would never take students who didn't want to learn from me. And so having kids just seems like the worst. Maybe better. I, I still think it's somewhat somewhat better than taking a pet. If you if you take a pet, the problem with a pet is you, you, you can't do as much for the pet as you can for a kid. I mean the greatness of having a kid is that you can do great things for them. You can you can you can help someone who's who's new to the world, right? It's like a newcomer, this this visitor to the this land of foreign from a foreign land. They don't even speak the language, they don't know the food to eat, they don't know the customs, they know nothing. So you oh, you can do great things for kids potentially. It's just a lot of work, and I mean, why take on that burden? There's lots of other kids already out there. There's lots of people out there who do who need your help. People who could better use it, who could better benefit from it. You're broke. Broke is good too. Having no money means having no uh, worries. There's um, who was it? It was uh, George Orwell, who wrote. Uh, I think it was George Orwell. Not wrote 1984 and Animal Farm. If I'm correct. He wrote. Um, he wrote about his experience being, being impoverished he found himself in paris with no money and so suddenly like like just something happened i can't remember if he got robbed or if he just i know something bad happened to him and he suddenly found himself completely penny penniless and he he was he panicked he was he was he was uh, completely consumed by this fear until it's it settled in and he realized that he was he had nowhere what he said is it's it's freeing because you ha you cannot fall any further it and what it is is from a buddhist perspective it changes your perspective you you let go of these conventional ideas of hunger, sickness. So, I mean, hunger is not an idea, but the ideas we have about hunger, sickness, death. We we make these things out to be boogeymen, like as well as not having any money. We think of them as being real problems, and it's not to trivialize this. I mean, the worst thing is to be in debt, which most people probably are. Most people are, and you probably are i assume by penniless you probably also mean you're in debt because that's such a common thing nowadays and that's really uh, suffering the buddha said ina ina danang dukang loke uh, being in debt is suffering in the world but in the world you see is the point it's still a worldly suffering and it it really cripples you in terms of your capacity to succeed in the world in a worldly sense but that's in the end ultimately irrelevant and so what poverty does to you is it provides you perspective you realize that it's not so bad i may get go hungry i may get sick i may even die but you know okay th those are realities they're not boogeymen they're not monsters they come to us all anyway we all get hungry even rich people we all get old and sick and we all die 
It's not, these aren't monsters. They're just reality and they're just a part of the cycle of samsara. We've done it all before. We've done all of this countless times before. It doesn't have any significance or meaning or importance. As far as being overweight, I mean, there's kind of a joke in there that you're not a loser if you're overweight. You're a gainer, right? You, you, you've gained a lot of weight. And so that's probably where we could, I mean, one of the places you can focus on is why you're overweight. It, um, I mean, I guess it has off, it, it can only have to do with eating too much and eating the wrong things. Now, eating the wrong things is sometimes unavoidable. Usually not. Usually there are ways to eat healthy but cheap but it's true that often the cheap food is unhealthy um, but it's usually just caused by overeating and it can be caused by overeating because of the depression from um, being upset at the fact that you have none of these burdens that you should be happy about um, and so yeah yeah that's a very important thing that you should focus on the the causes of, of being overweight and the, the feelings about being overweight why do you include that in here because well, first of all, you call it overweight, which means you believe that there's something wrong with it, right? It's 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 not right. It's it's outside of what is right, and um, the fact that you you add it in here is a sign that it's something that makes you feel like a loser, right? You feel feel like like how could I possibly be a winner if I'm overweight? And these are all the real problem. This is what really makes you a quote-unquote loser. I mean, this is what causes you to lose out on happiness and peace and freedom from suffering, is these, attitude, these attitudes. And no, you shouldn't try to pretend like you don't have them. You shouldn't try to pretend like you're not depressed or try to pretend to be happy or make yourself happy. But you should face them. You should learn about them. You should observe them. And forget about the fact that you're overweight. Forget about the fact that you have no wife, no kids, that you're broke. These are not consequential. Don't focus on these things. You do need some uh, reasonable effort towards livelihood. That's something the Buddha made clear, you know, was, was acknowledged. Yes, you need to live. So spend time every day working on that, how to survive. And it can just be, sometimes it can even just be food stamps, food banks, those sorts of things are still livelihood. And be reasonable about that. But apart from that, all of these things are, that they are not a problem. The problem is you have an attitude about them. You want the wife, you want kids, you want money. And it's not even usually so much that you want these things, it's just that you feel bad and and it it snowballs. You feel bad about one thing, and then so you think of something else, and you you uh, apply the same habit because it's habit forming. When you get upset about one thing, you you develop the habit of getting upset, and then when you think about having, oh, and also I have no wife. Oh yeah, and I have no kids. What else can I be upset about? I'm broke, and and look at me, I'm overweight. You add these things, and that's just habit. So just face those and watch those habits. And as you watch them, you'll change, because watching is a good habit. Watching is a habit that leads to clarity. It leads you to familiarity, to knowledge, to understanding. And understanding prevents bad habits. You just don't, don't get upset if you understand. You truly understand. So just spend time doing that. Don't feel bad. And don't, uh, don't try to feel good. Just however you feel, when you do feel bad, when you do feel good, feel mindful. Be mindful of it. Ante, there's one further question in the top tier. Have you got more time to answer? I do if you do. I do. Here we are. I find it very difficult to observe thoughts during meditation, because as soon as I realized that I was lost in thoughts, my thoughts disappear, and there is no more thought in my head that I can observe. Do you have any advice? Yeah, you don't have to observe them. That's not, that's not what mindfulness is. Mindfulness is, is re reminding yourself. So I, I, I maybe make that not so clear when I talk. It, it, I say things like observing, but it's not technically what's happening, and that's what you're seeing. What you're observing is the impermanence of reality, that the thoughts cease. The noting is, in fact, the, the noting 
which gives rise to mindfulness, which is the observing part. But the noting is to remind yourself, to to cut off, uh, to to um, cut in cut at, cut in front or cut in on the habits that would arise, the reactions that would arise, the the extrapolations that would arise. So when you think something we make something out of the thought and we get carried away by it, right? We get carried away by future thoughts about that original thought. When you say thinking, you stop that. And that uh, directs your mind to perceive thoughts just as thoughts. That's what's important about it. But um, you're already observing the thought and the noting just helps you stay observant instead of reactionary. That's the point. So after you notice that the thought's gone, just say thinking. End it there. Yep, that was thinking. That's all. Thank you, Bhante. You've answered every question we're prepared to ask today. Great. Thank you all for your questions. Thanks, Chris. Edit for your help. Of course. Have a good week, everyone. Sadhu. Sadhu.